right, hello and welcome to another Sales Expert Insight with myself, John Golden from Pipeliner CRM and Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. And today I'm joined by the always interesting Mike Bosworth. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing well today, John. Thank you. And where are you today, Mike? I am on happily on Orcas Island up in the San Juan Islands, oh, up wow. near Brit Victoria, British Columbia. Very nice. Excellent. Uh, and I'm here in San Diego. British Columbia sounds beautiful. So what we wanted to do today is talk about the concept of customer integration. So okay. you know, we all know about uh, technology integration and other sorts of integration, but um, I haven't heard before the idea of customer integration. So, Mike, do you want to explain a little bit what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, uh, from from a couple of fronts. Um, I had the experience when, well, let me let me back up. A survey was done twenty years ago of professional buyers. Mm -hmm. These are people who buy for a living from salespeople. Their job for their corporation is to buy. <clears throat> and they ask them, what's the most important thing to you about a salesperson you deal with? Number one answer in that survey was they want to deal with a, a salesperson who has command over his or her company resources. So now park that aside. And now I'll take you back to 1972 when I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona, mm -hmm. I was 25 mm -hmm. years old, I'd been in the military, and I got an entry level help desk job with the division of Xerox that invented cloud computing in 1969, Xerox Computer Services, and they needed somebody on the help desk. And I was, most startup companies don't hire people right out of college, right. but they had a job that none of their experienced people wanted, which was the help desk. They used to rotate their software consultants through it, and they all were ready to go on strike. And they finally said to management, put somebody on that desk full time. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, get, so get some guy straight out of college who doesn't know any better. <laughs> right, right. But they did a brilliant thing, Xerox Computer Services, and I didn't realize it until years later, what brilliant. During my first 90 days on that help desk, one of five, over, over 90 days, five different senior managers in Xerox Computer Services, along with his or her spouse, invited me and my spouse to dinner. Mm. Just the four of us. And by the time I'd been on that desk 90 days, not only could I get any, if a customer had a problem and the programs weren't working right, I'd been to dinner and shared stories with vice president of development. I'd get him on the phone and say, I'm wrestling with this. I don't know what to do. If I didn't know how to answer, I could call. I had the billing department. I, you know, I had all these different functions right. within the company where even though I was a rookie, I had command over my company resources because they empowered me because we got to go out and share where'd you grow up, you know, where'd you go to school, and we we got to share each other's stories. And with that, that connection, I was integrated into that entire organization. I was employee no, number 120, and even though I was 25 years old and didn't know anything, I could get anything fixed for any customer because they integrated me with those senior people. So you then became, as you say, you became a very valuable resource to the customers because you knew exactly where to go and who to talk to to get stuff done. And they only had to make one phone call right? to me. And so, so let's get back to your point then about, so customer integration is really about um, the customer having access to somebody or some persons who can really help them, right? Or within the, yes, at least, but even better would be if we could figure out a way to integrate the silos within virtually every organization, there's different silos that all serve the customer. There's strategic marketing, there's tactical marketing, there's product training, there's sales, 
there's accounting, there's billing, there's product development. And in most companies, the salespeople end up having to learn those silos and on their own develop their own network of who do I call for what. And because most companies don't formally integrate or figure out some way to facilitate connection. When we talk about integration, to me, it's facilitating the opportunity for the employees and different departments, different silos to have a chance to get to know each other at a personal level and build some trust and some bonding. So when something does happen, that those connections, they are all integrated around the customer. So part of the problem is, uh, as I see it, is that in most organizations, uh, departments or whatever, they build processes that work for the job they do or the role they're trying to fulfill. And they try to build them as efficiently as possible, but they don't build their processes with another department in mind, generally speaking, unless they have a relationship. And I think in totality, everybody doesn't build their processes with the customer in mind. I don't think most companies do. They're, they really, that somehow they've just grown up where the different silos all, all figure out how to coexist, mm-hmm. but they haven't really done anything proactively. And the interesting thing now, John, is with all this technology, mm-hmm. more and more companies are using technology to decrease the number of human to human interactions between the silos in their own company. You know, ideal. most heads of marketing and heads of sales would love it if they never had to talk to each other. Right? <laughs> Let's just let the, the technology, you know, pass everything back and forth. Yeah, so it's I, going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on a phrase you use because I think it's really pertinent here is where you say that departments have learned to coexist. And it's always like, I mean, the picture that popped into my head, it's almost like there's an uneasy peace <laughs> between them. So it's coexisting. It's not looking at, at, at integration. And it's certainly not looking at how do we set ourselves up so the customer can be best served, right? Uh, and if they need a piece of information yeah. or whatever, that they can can get to it immediately and it doesn't have to be a magical mystery tour, right? Well, let's take the same concept and look at the United States Congress. Mm-hmm. Right now, the Democrats and the Republicans are trying to coexist, even though they hate each other's guts, instead of doing what's right for the citizen. Mm-hmm. So I'd love Congress to do citizen integration. That's a great idea. Right? which is integrate around the needs of the voter, the citizen, instead of coexisting politically with the other side. So if you're, when you're advising organizations on this topic, or if you're to advise an organization, uh, how would you tell them to start? Where's, where's the number one place to start on, on a customer integration initiative? Well, all I know is what I'm really good at doing. And I've, I've kind of li- I've learned about team building accidentally because I'm in the business of doing connection workshops initially for salespeople to teach them how to connect better with their customers so they have more trust, so they sell more. And accidentally, my client base will end up having me do a a workshop where they've got people from strategic marketing, tactical marketing, product development, customer support, sales and sales management, all in one room. Mm -hmm. And the process we go through, and it's around the customer, you know, customer zero selling, and they end up in six different experiential groups of four people with a coach over two and a half days, And by the end of it, it's a love fest and they're all loving each other, regardless of what department or silo or or whatever they do. And so many times they'll say, you know, I've been down the I've been in the cubicle next to that person for the last seven years. And I finally, over the last two and a half days, know who's in the cubicle next to me. I never took the time. Right. And but it was 
had we had I gone out and tried to sell those companies on connection workshops for their silos, they would have laughed at me. Sure. The reason they bought from me was because they thought I could teach their salespeople to sell more, and therefore they were basing it on ex expected revenue increase from selling. They weren't doing it altruistically. <laughs> They were doing it around, let's teach our people to sell more so we can get more revenue. The team building happened to be accidental, but it was profound when you experience it. So um, so what, what's involved in that? So what, what are the eye openers for uh, departments realizing, you know, not just that they're, they're human beings that they work with who have interesting stories themselves, but the breakthrough where they see how this actually enhances the customer experience? Boy, that's a good question. We, we do six different experiential exercises. I'll, I'll tell you a couple. Um, the first one is they have to learn to trust each other. Mm -hmm. And the first experiential exercise is we have them all build with help and then tell a 90 second story about a single event that happened in their life. It might've been when they were eight years old mm -hmm. where it completely changed their perspective. And a lot of people end up with a car accident where somebody got injured and, you know, or yeah, I mean some pretty profound things. And so that first story exercise already because if you're really going to tell an honest story about an event that happened to you, you're going to have to get vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And vulnerability is the key to connection. But how many organizations facilitate any, any vulnerability between departments or human beings on purpose? Well, they don't. One tenth of one percent? I mean, it's almost unheard of. It's so touchy-feely. You know, and we have them then build the story and learn to tend each other on why I do what I do. Their story of who I am and why I do what I do professionally. That gets them, you know, sharing, you know, I had this profound thing and I decided to change my career or whatever. And one of the big ones was accidental when I was doing a workshop for a company that was growing by mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having 36 people in a room from four different acquisitions, like nine people each. And typically one of the standard stories we build in my workshops is a customer hero story, a story about how we help one of our customers mm -hmm. solve a problem, achieve a goal, and become a hero in their own organization right. using our stuff. Mm -hmm. But I realized, whoops, mm -hmm. my client doesn't want these four different people, these four different acquisitions building stories about the companies they used to work for that right. competed with each other. So what I did is I put them in groups of acquisition A, B, C, and D, four people and a coach. And we had, we broke them into nine. And then we had each of them think about in the future, if we integrate the four technologies that are now part of this new parent company, think about a, a solution you can put together a year from now, if you integrate all four of those. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was magical. Uh, because now they're collaborating with the future vision about the customer using the fantasy combination of all their technologies. Wow. And uh, I've actually got a link I'll send you of, of a before, the, one of their before stories and one of their after, after they did this workshop, one of the future stories that came out of it. They made a little video about it. And uh, any listeners who want that, just have them go to my website and send me an email, and I'll, uh, and I'll send them. To, and I'll share it with you, too, John, if you want. It's yeah, absolutely. Pretty absolutely. So a lot of what – so in, in essence, a lot of what you're talking about here at the end of the day is – creating a deliberate culture as opposed to just letting a culture happen organically? Boy, well, you can – lots of things can happen organically, but, boy, if you can figure out a way to facilitate it, your, your time to competence goes way up. I mean, you know, mo most companies, when they hire a new salesperson – 
they, they teach them the product as a noun and then they throw them out there and it typically takes them 12 to 18 months on their own to figure out who are the real buyer personas we sell to, yeah. how do they do their job without our stuff, how do they do their job with our stuff, how do I learn to describe that, what kind of results do they get? Virtually every company out there is forcing their salespeople to learn that part on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of facilitating it, um, one of the brightest things that one of my clients figured out how to do, and they gave me, I get some of my best ideas from my clients, is now when they hire a new salesperson, they have a few happy customers that, However they've arranged a quid pro quo, these happy customers help them train their new salespeople. So if I hire you as a new salesperson, I'm going to say, John, I want you to get on the phone with this person in this department in, in this company and find out how they're using our products, how he or she is using our product, and then find out how they did it before they had our product and build a story around that. And when the salespeople do a few of those tending customer usage stories, mm -hmm. boy, do they come up to speed quick because now they, they go out and they can describe that on a sales call. They never, on their own, it would have taken them 18 sure. months to learn how to do that. Now, that's a fantastic example. So they're immediately learning the real world application uh, rather than just the theoretical. And let's face it, customers always use your product or service um, slightly differently than you, you know, than you think they're going to use them, right? But again, it's, it's really learning the story from the customer's perspective of how they use our, our product. And one of the hardest things in our workshops is when we have them build customer hero stories, especially like we had these guys who were financial planners and they start to tell what they thought was a customer hero story. And within 10 seconds, and they're saying what I was able to do for them was, sure. and I said, well, who's the hero in this story now? <laughs> and they go, Oh, you know, that they want to be, they, they're used to being the hero instead of letting the customer be the hero. And uh, the best, I think you almost as an organization have to agree that we're going to do customer hero stories instead of salesperson hero stories or company hero stories or consultant hero stories. And for a lot of companies, you know, if you hear these salespeople on calls, they say, well, John, our solution will do this yeah. and our solution will do that. Really? <laughs> You're talking to me about your solution when you don't know what my problem is? Exactly. I mean, so, but they're uh, making the product the hero instead of the customer. Yeah, exactly. So uh, especially now in this era of increased commoditization, right, where, where a lot of buyers uh, perceive products and services to be swappable, to be very the same and everything. Um, Focusing on something like customer integration could really be a competitive differentiator, right? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think customers find out pretty quickly if they're able to call one person at a company when they need help or if they need a whole list of who to call for what. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the, the best test of customer integration is can your customer call one person and whatever the problem is, that one person know, is connected enough within your organization that he or she can serve that customer versus that customer needing to have to call this person in this department. I mean, I've seen it over the years. You've probably, you know, seen it with companies that you, you bought from that mm -hmm. you need to have the names of three or four or five different people to call. Or worse, uh, when you call one person, they just, they give you the name of somebody else to call yeah. <laughs> instead of yeah. calling it for you. Oh, say, oh, John, you shouldn't have called me for yeah. this. Call, yeah, call <laughs> Joe over here. Oh, you know? Yeah, and then you end up saying, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have bought from you in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the and, and the, other, the other question, or question that just came into my mind when you're talking about today's buyers, a lot of cases, 
today's buyers know a lot more about your technology mm -hmm. than they did even 10 years ago. And if you're in sales, your real challenge is to relate human being to human being with this buyer. And the worst thing you can do as a salesperson to relate to a buyer is to start pitching your product right away. Uh, and it's funny because if you look at, as you mentioned earlier in this conversation, and it's, it's a good, uh, good way to, uh, to finish up here, is you were saying that uh, – you know, a lot of companies are using technology to remove the human interaction, and it's fine yeah. for some efficiency, all of that. But at the end of the day, um, if you remove all of the human relationship, then what is there to bind me to your company? Well, especially in the B2B world. Mm -hmm. Now, in the B2C sure, world, sure. I mean, given, you know, you've got to automate, you know, get, get them the answers, frequently ask mm -hmm. questions, you know, YouTubes and how to use it. But boy, when you're selling something complex to an organization that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and is complicated and takes a long time to implement, boy, in those cases, if, if the customer's got one person they trust, it's huge, huge. Yeah. And well, unusual. <laughs> and, un and unusual. So there you go for people listening. There's a great opportunity for you there to surprise your customers. So listen, Mike, as always, it's been a, a fascinating and entertaining conversation. Uh, before we go, for those of people out there, the few people left who don't know who you are, why don't you tell them a little bit more about you and your organization and how they can learn more? All right. Well, you can go to MikeBosworth.com. I've been a sales trainer for 40 some years, but it's only been in the last eight years where I've started focusing on human connection and building trust and really the first three minutes of a sales call because a lot of salespeople, 80% of salespeople don't connect and build trust intuitively. The top 20% do it intuitively, so they can't teach anybody else. The bottom 80% need a structure and a framework, and we built one around storytelling and story tending that teaches the non-intuitive people how to connect. Perfect, listen, thanks uh, thanks again, Mike. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM, it's been another expert insight. Uh, see you all for another one soon, thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.